Good morning. We are extremely lucky today to have Professor Anna Pyle come and speak with us. Now, Professor Pyle is an HHMI investigator. That's Howard Hughes Med Medical Institute investigator. And this is an award that's given to only the top scientists in the field. And it really means that she's extraordinarily special, and I think you'll get to see that today. Um, she has a BA in chemistry from Princeton University, one of those other schools from the South, a PhD in chemistry from Columbia University, another questionable institution somewhere to the uh, west of us. She's won an incredible number of awards over the years. Besides being a Howard Hughes medical investigator, she was a Searle scholar, a Beckman Young investigator, and there's many, many more on this list, uh, National Science Foundation Young Investigator Award and so forth and so on, an impressive list of achievements. But I think what the most impressive thing is is that she does really neat, really beautiful science that she can actually explain to all of us today, and we're very lucky to have her. Thanks so much for that very nice introduction. I, I think what we're most lucky about is that there are people like Aaron and Inisa who put together things so science can be visible to everybody. And it doesn't, isn't just like the lucky few, such as myself, who get to go into lab and have all this fun every day. You can see a little taste of it. Um, I should also mention about me, just so you know, because there are a lot of kids in the audience. I have kids, too. So hopefully some of this talk I'll tell you about has been helped by the fact that they ask me lots of questions. Thomas is here, he's nine, and I have twin girls who are six. So that's three, and then all the neighbor kids. So, so I'm pretty used to having kids around, and, and, and they've always helped me explain things. Okay, so let's get He did all that careful work to get this thing just right, and I yanked it off. I think I can maybe replicate it. How's that? Is it okay? It's kind of like in a precarious position here. Okay, so, so let, let me explain what we're gonna do today here. So we're gonna start off with a movie that was not made by me. It was funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and it was made in, by a collaborative effort of scientists at Harvard. And it, it's really gonna be, it, it's the beginning of a new kind of um, revolution in animation that's the result of a collaboration between scientists and artists. And so what you're going to see is, um, is sort of the function of a whole bunch of machines as a, as a cell changes shape. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what this cell is doing in a second. But just to tell you a little bit more about the film, a lot of scientists like me, we try to solve the structures of biomolecules so we can tell exactly what they look like and how they look when they're in different stages of motion. But it doesn't do much good to help people see how they function unless an artist can put it all into, into sort of a film so you can see them at work. So in this movie, when you see it, you'll notice that you see molecules walking around. That's actually what they look like for the most part because they're based on the structures that scientists have solved. So this is a new thing that's wonderful that's happening in science in that artists and scientists are working together to help us communicate better. So the movie you'll see here is about what happens in a white blood cell when the cells surrounding it, the skin cells, tell it, we have to go on red alert because there's an infection. And the white blood cell is the SWAT team of the body. It goes out to combat germs that get in us. And what you're going to see are all the machines and motors inside the white blood cell that help get it ready to go out and fight. Okay, so I will try and relate some of the changes, although I'm not a cell biologist. You heard I was a chemist, which is true. But in any case, I will try to relate some of the things that are going on as the movie goes, but mostly just enjoy the film. Do you have sound? You guys can't hear the sound? Okay, well, you know what? I'm gonna try again. Let's see if I crank it up on my computer, if you can hear it, if the system here, it's just that it's my computer making it problematic. Is the system here plugged into this? You can hear? Oh, 
okay, so what's happened here, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to back all the way up. Okay. So here's a white blood cell, and it's in contact with the skin cell, and it's getting, the skin cell is sending it a message through these molecules telling it it's time to get ready to gear up to fight an infection, and they're talking through those molecules. And they send the signal along a cell membrane on those rafts. And these are molecules involved in signaling and sending the messages between the cells. And they're getting transported along and through the skeleton of the cell. And this is sort of the membrane skeleton on the outside. This is part of the cellular cytoskeleton as we go inside the cell. It's made of these protein filaments. And one thing the white blood cell has to do is change its shape to combat infection. And here it's making these special skeletal structures to change its shape. It's got to break old structures and build new ones. It's building highways for motor proteins to transport molecules to the, its surface. And these are the cargo motors. We're going to be seeing them in great detail in this talk. And they transport big stuff from the inside of the cell to the exterior. And every time you see a little blob, you like that it's a cargo motor moving along. Now, the nucleus of the cell sends out RNA. And that's because this cell, to fight infection, has to make some new proteins. So these ribosomal protein factories load onto the RNA, and they start to make protein encoded by this long, loopy RNA. Some of these proteins have to be taken to the mitochondria, this big lobby looking guy is a mitochondria. And in that case, the ribosome actually makes the proteins and sticks them in the mitochondrial membrane. Some of the proteins made in some of the membranes of the cell have to be kept in these giant bags to be exported to the surface. And those kinase and cargo motors take it to this cool structure called the Golgi, and they get changed. That gets fused with the outer cell membrane and all the contents of that bag get dumped out. And then we get these special signaling molecules on the surface. Here's the white blood cell. Here's the skin cell. They're going to talk now this way. Now he's going to touch that guy and send chemical signals to the other cell. And that tells the white blood cell, OK, you're ready for action. Now he's changing his shape. Look at that. He's like sliding along. This will help him go through the cells between cells, and now he's ready to fight it, and he's in the bloodstream, ready to go to his target. Okay? So, so that's just to sort of get you set up. I, I'm worried that the rest of the talk will seem so boring compared to that. <laughs> that's so cool. But there are animations of this type throughout the talk. Now, one of the things that you guys probably picked up on that is, I think, the coolest thing about this film is the um, kinesin molecules that are marching along carrying the big bag, right? It looks, like something, it looks like something out of The Sorcerer's Apprentice, that old Disney movie. And um, that's the kind of motor we'll be talking about today. In fact, he's going to be our first example. So today, we're going to take three different types of motor proteins, and we're going to describe them in detail. And the reason I like these is they're not just molecules that just, you know, sit there. I like to study molecules that walk, shuffle, spin, and carry stuff around. And that's because, as you saw in the film, our cells are full of these little nano machines. It's like they're full of these little robots and factories. And today, if possible, I'd like to give you a flavor for how they work. And um, probably won't, we won't get all the details, but if you just develop an interest in them, there's a lot more you can learn about them. So of the different kinds of machines we'll discuss, there are many kinds in the cell, but we, don't, we only have a half an hour. So we're going to talk about three. We've already seen an animation of a cargo motor, and I'll show you there are several kinds. Some of them walk foot over foot, some of them shuffle, and some of them hop, and I'll show you the difference. 
Another beautiful kind of motor that is uh, fun to study are rotary motors that spin and do work, just like a water wheel. And then the kind I personally study are motors that, instead of tracking on that protein highway like we saw in the movie, they move on DNA or RNA, and they do different operations on the DNA. And those are called helicases. So we'll look, try to take a look at all three. And in each case, what I want to do is show you an animation so you can sort of see what the molecule looks like when it's in action. Then I want to see if I can explain the way they work, which I will try to do. But if it's confusing, please raise your hand. And finally, I think it's very important that you all see real experiments and real data demonstrating how we study these molecules so you can actually watch them. And in each case, we'll be looking at single molecule experiments. Because to look at molecular motion, we need at least two kinds of information. One, we need to understand the molecular structure. And second, we need to be able to watch individual molecules in action. So we have to develop ways to look at things that are extremely small, OK? Molecules are really small. It's very important before we start for everybody to kind of get a grip on that. Um, if we were to, you know, the kinesin you saw marching along, it looks like a little person, right? If you had as many kinesins as there are people in the United States and you were to pack them together, you still wouldn't be able to see them. I mean, they're really, really tiny, okay? So we have to come up with special methods, and some of our methods involve light. And I'll show you, in some cases, we put a big light on the molecule that special cameras can sense. And in other cases, we have lasers that allow us to pull on them one at a time and watch what they do. So in each case, I'll try to show you a single molecule experiment. All right, our first category are the cargo motors. And these are nanomachines that walk on tracks and carry things around. And they also help to maintain the, the cytoskeleton or overall architecture of a cell. There are three basic kinds of cytoskeletal cargo motors, kinesin, dynein, and myosin. And they, can they like to move things directionally. Did you notice in the movie that kinesin didn't just kind of go forward and then back and then forward again? No, he marched forward continuously. And this is one of the great mysteries that all of us in the field are studying right now. How can a molecule have directional motion from point A to point B? How is that accomplished? And we're not totally sure yet, but that's one of the things we're working on. So to give you an example, here is a nerve cell that's trying to grow out. Nerves can be very long. The nerves in our body can be meters long. And to get um, molecules from the cell body out to the part of the nerve cell that's growing, we have these long tubulin fibers that we saw in the movie, those tracks. And the cargo motors, kinesin and dynein, carry things from one part of the cell to the other. The kinesin move them this way. Now let's look at our kinesin again. Remember we saw him. It's as if he has feet down here and a body and little arms that carry all kinds of stuff, okay? And carry them from the cell body to the end of the cell. Now once they get down here, there's a different motor with a different polarity with respect to the track that likes to go in the other direction. And his, he's named dynein. Um, and you can see dynein looks totally different. He has delicate little feet. Looks like he's wearing, you know, fancy pants, and he has this like little tiny tether to his cargo. These have no similarity or very little similarity structurally, but they, they are partners in moving things around. So that's just sort of an example of how all that works. A guy named Ron Vail at UCSF um, wrote a brilliant article that um, articulate, it was actually called How Things Move. That was just the name of it. And he, he articulated that there are five basic components in the cargo motor toolbox, five kinds of cargo motors that I'm showing you here. And the reason I'm showing you them right now is so you can see they have a lot of similarities, but they have some differences. Look how different dynein looks 
from kinesin, who we've been talking about. But I like how he colored these with the blue feet, gray body, and the green carrying arms. Okay? So basically, this is our toolkit in our body for things that carry stuff around. And like all the motors we'll talk about today, they need fuel. And they don't burn gasoline. They burn the body's fuel, which is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And it looks like this. Okay? This is a high energy molecule that um, undergoes breakage at this position. And when it does so, it allows molecules to change conformation and actually power movement indirectly. And I'll show you a little bit about how that works in a minute. So again, from um, Ron's article, um, and I'll show you a movie of kinesin walking in a second, uh, myosins, standard myosins, which are what help move around things in our muscle cells, myosin is essential for the way our muscles work. Like right now when I'm doing this, all these myosins are actively doing their thing. Um, and myosins have two feet, but in conventional myosins, they're not using them both to walk like this. They hop on one, and they go directionally, which is interesting how that possibly works. Whereas kinesin is using them both to actually walk foot over foot or hand over hand. And there are yet other motors in the helicase family that move forward not by walking, but by shuffling. So one foot goes forward, and then the other one slides behind, like that. So all different strategies for motion along a track are utilized in biological systems by molecules. And they all use ATP to move and do work. And how do they do that? Just one more word before we show some more cute movies, is that it's not that the energy of ATP is magically converted into heat, and that's what powers these molecules. Instead, the reason ATP is the fuel for these motors is that it's used as a switch. This kinesin part down here, this little foot and ankle region, is the part that powers the movement. And the way it does that is that when this part binds ATP, the ankle is in this configuration. When the ATP is hydrolyzed, the uh, structure changes. In other words, when ATP is split into two pieces, this guy can't maintain this same structure, and he flips out, and he assumes a new structure, and that flips this foot forward, and it plunks down in a new spot, okay? So in fact, instead of like our car motor, where energy is converted in a different way, these guys convert energy by, um, convert the energy in a chemical bond by changing their conformation and moving directionally or spinning directionally. Okay, that's enough of all kinds of details here. Now let's see how this works. Here's a kinesin. It's about to set down on a microtubule. The foot sits. It's in this conformation. It binds an ATP, burns it, and that changes the conformation here, which throws the other foot forward. It also changes its affinity for the lattice, or the highway it's on. The other foot's doing the same thing, and it's coordinating its motion with this one. So then this one can lie down. This one hydrolyzed already. So he's going to pick up soon and get flung around and set down forward. Okay. Now, one thing we do know about directional motion is that this tubulin filament is not the same going forward as backward. As you'll probably notice from the, from the movie and from this picture here, it has a polarity. Okay. This molecule likes to have, you could imagine, the stripes are kind of going asymmetrically like this. Somehow this molecule senses that orientation of the polymer, and that helps it be directional and go in the right direction. Okay, there's our guy again. You can watch him walk a little bit more. It's always fun. <laughs> so he binds an ATP, he hydrolyzes it, the neck changes conformation, and then the whole superstructure changes in response. And then the forward foot is undergoing the same process, flinging the other foot forward, etc. 
And this is an animation created by a collaboration between Ron Vale and Graham Johnson. I think Graham Johnson was the artist who put all of this into pictures so we can see. Okay, then I promised you guys an experiment, right? So you could actually see molecules in motion. And this is work done by a colleague at Brandeis named Jeff, Jeff Gellis. And Jeff did a cool thing. He took a kinesin and he had it hold a giant polystyrene bead. Okay, this bead is huge compared to the kinesin. Um, but in, a in water, in a cellular environment, it's almost like things feel sort of weightless. There isn't momentum and weight in the same way that we feel it in the microscopic world. So it's not like this big bead is going to crush Mr. Kinesin here. He's going to be, it's going to sort of float above him, and the kinesin is going to be able to walk even though he's stuck carrying this massive bead. Here's the bead, and we can see it in a very, very good camera. And here's a track of tubulin. And what you're going to see is a single molecule of kinesin carrying this bead. Why do we do this? So that we can tell how fast kinesin walks, which is actually pretty fast. Now, I want you to see there's times when he appears to pause. We're going to talk about that in a second. Most of the time, he's motoring along pretty smoothly. And experiments like this help us to tell all kinds of mechanical properties of the molecule. Now, I'm going to show you another thing. Remember when I said ATP is food for these guys? They like it, OK? They bind it, they hydrolyze it, and they can keep walking. As long as they have enough ATP, they keep going. But remember in the movie, there are pauses? And that's because Jeff did a dirty trick to this kinesin. In addition to giving it some ATP, it, he threw in this yucky molecule, AMPPNP, which is known as an inhibitor. Notice you can't cut it here. That linkage can't be cut by the kinesin. So the reason we saw pauses here and here was because occasionally the kinesin didn't bind its favorite food. It bound this molecule, and it stopped. It was like, ugh. And then that molecule had to, had to leave before a good one could bind, and the kinesin could keep going. Okay. So one of the ways we study molecules is to give them the food they like and then occasionally give them something yucky and see how they respond to it. And you can actually see that process in this video. So let me back up, show it to you one more time. Okay, so he's happy, he's eating. Oh, AMPP and B, yuck. Now he's going. He paused for a second. And the time frames of all of these processes tell us a lot about how quickly these guys bind their energy, use it. We get all kinds of information from these movies. OK, so that was a flavor of how we study directional motors. Yeah? Yeah, the real time for that one. Um, it's hard to say because that's, a, that's in a mixture of, of different components. But how fast kinesin actually tracks, um, it's, uh, I, I, yesterday I was looking this up and the number escapes me. But if, if you think about how it's tracking through a cell, it's going to get through an entire cell in I think about a millisecond time scale. So they're moving quite quickly. Um, this is at a scale that's hard to see because, you know, of the translation of, of microscopic space to larger space. So rotary motors is our next topic. And these are neat because they don't go forward, they spin around. Okay? And we use rotary motors in our cells, or many types of cells have clocks inside of them and have all kinds of pumps and things inside of them. And most of them, in terms of their molecular structure, are rotary motors. And one of the most important examples of these is the F1 or CF1 ATPase. And this is a really complicated slide, and there's only a few things I want you to take away from it. There's a rotary motor that's stuck inside the membrane of one of the cellular compartments called the mitochondria. And it has a part that sort of sticks it in the membrane. It has a part in the center that rotates, just like the interior of a uh, water wheel. 
And then there are also, um, there's this sort of uh, circular component that spins around that within which there are a series of chemical reactions that help us to actually make ATP. Now, remember I told you that ATP is the fuel of the cell? Well, we also have to make it. We make it in our mitochondria. And in, um, it's also synthesized, if you're a plant, in your chloroplasts. And so it's actually made in this rotating motor. Now, this really does function to some extent like a water wheel. But instead of water, one of the things that helps push it is a flow of tiny, tiny atoms called protons. And in a plant, these are made um, during photosynthesis. There's a gradient of protons that's made as the photosynthetic molecules in a plant split water into oxygen and protons. Those flow then into the cell and out through our special machine, ATP synthase. All right? And we're going to look at the structure of this and how it spins in a second. But just so you see how it works, you can get the same effect whenever you have a paddle or a, a sort of a pinwheel structure in a flow of water where the water comes in sort of toward the bottom and leaves toward the top of a tube, okay, or of, of a container. So the, the way that an ATPA since, sits inside the membrane is very much like this uh, vortex power plant that has a water wheel in it. So we actually know the molecular structure of the parts of this pump. And this is the internal part that moves and spins around. And then this series of six molecules assemble. So each one of these is a separate protein. And they assemble to make this beautiful donut. And inside the donut is this long thing that's going to be the thing rotating inside. And every time he rotates and faces one of these um, sets of red and yellow molecules, it squishes the starting materials for the ATP together. So in other words, ATP is made up of some smaller parts. And to get the ATP to get made, for all those parts to come together, this machine basically squishes them together with force, OK? So basically, it's throwing phosphate and adenosine diphosphate together into this space, smashing them together, and it makes ATP. And then we use that, OK? So you're going to see how this works in the next video. This is the rotation. We're looking at the top of ATP synthase now as it rotates. And this is the internal uh, rotating uh, component. And you see it goes at about 120 degrees with each rotation, squishing the parts into the face of these and making a molecule every time. Okay? So for every full rotation, it's going to make three ATPs. See? How its symmetry is such that it would make three rather than six. Okay? So you're seeing it rotate from the top. Let's look at it rotate from the side. As it tries to make the ATP and push the ingredients together, these components kind of bulge out a little bit, OK, as everything comes together. So the whole structure changes and shifts during this process of making ATP. And one of the things that makes this happen, although we can't visualize it in this movie, is the flow of protons through here interacting with other components that are invisible to us in this video. OK, so once again, how about an experiment? Um, in this experiment, which was done by this wonderful Japanese lab, Yoshida's lab, what they did is they took that whole machine and they stuck it on a bead. And they put that on a cover slip in a microscope. And they made it happy so that it would actually spin. But it's too small to see, right? I mean, we wouldn't be able to see it if we didn't modify it. So on this gamma armature, remember the central component that's spinning inside those uh, six proteins? They attached a super long stick, OK? It's completely straight. And it's a giant stick made of the protein called actin, OK? It's a long actin filament. 
And if you imagine if I were the ATPase molecule and I were here, this stick they put on him would go all the way out many, many streets away. Okay, so it would be huge. And plus, they made the stick so that it has some ability for us to see it in light. Okay, so we can visualize this stick. Now, we can actually watch this thing spin and it'll tell us how fast it spins and what are the properties of this thing while it spins. So you're going to see an F1 ATPase spin in real time. Let me move this. One of the things we do with these experiments is we actually take frames of these pictures and plot how often the stick is at a certain degrees in the circle. And if you bin all this information, if you organize all the information, you see that on average, it's actually stopping at 100, or pausing at 120 degree increments. So it's not a completely uniform, smooth cycle. It's kind of more like, mm, mm, mm. I'm not doing very well. I don't have a very good elbow that will completely rotate. But in any case, you get the idea that it's, um, it stops in three places on average. OK? Now finally, as it's getting late, we're going to see one final class of motors, and it's my favorite one, actually, because it's what we do. And these are nanomachines that tear apart DNA and RNA, and they're called helicases. And we need these because they help to take care of our genome. Remember, all the information that makes us us is inside our DNA in the nucleus, and that requires a lot of care. It, we have to, our cells have to take care of that DNA, and they have to make more of it when a cell divides. So there's a lot of work involved in taking care of DNA. And a lot of that is done by the machines we'll see next. Now you're going to see a movie of the replication of DNA and what a helicase does. Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. I don't think you guys can hear that up there, can you? You are looking at an assembly line of amazing miniature biochemical machines. This is the replication complex of DNA. What, what we're looking at here is the machine that works when it's time to copy our DNA. <coughs> the DNA to be copied is coming in here, and it's stripped apart by this blue machine here. This is the helicase. What she just said is it spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine. I think that's 66,000 RPM. And the strands come out this direction and this direction. And what's sitting on it, the green things, are polymerases. These are the copying machines. They grab the single strand, and they'll make a new copy that's double-stranded DNA and is coming out either end. Okay? So this strand's being opened. This strand is then, once it's opened, it's being copied. Okay? So that blue part is the helicase that I showed you before. Now you're going to see it in green. Once again, um, Nature has used these um, multiples of proteins and formed them into rings to make all kinds of molecular components. So this is what's known as a hexameric helicase. It's made of six of these proteins. And what, you, what happens is that one of the strands of DNA goes through the middle of this thing. The other strand is spit out the side, because only one strand can fit through the hole. Okay? And these machines, just like the machines we showed before, they also burn ATP, and they undergo changes in conformation, and that's what helps propel them along the strand. Now, one of the things I wanted to tell you about when I showed you helicases, though, is that rotary motors and helicases are all made from this ancient protein component. It's called the Rec A fold, or the Rec A protein. Not this little part hanging out here, but this part. This is a very ancient protein building block that must have arisen very, very early in evolution. And it's been used continually in the creation of almost all the machines in our body. So it's an ancient construction module. So really, the machines in our body are built the same way that you would build something out of Legos. You have all these bits of Lego all over your playroom floor, your bedroom floor, but many of them are the same type of component. And you, when you take apart your favorite thing you built out of Lego, you can build something else out of the pieces. It's exactly the same in nature. And the Rec A fold is the ultimate natural Lego piece. 
And let me show you that so I can prove it to you. Here is the hexameric helicase I showed you. And this is the RecA protein. What we can do with computers is to lay these proteins on top of each other and see how well they match. It's almost a perfect match in structure. So it's been used repeatedly during evolution to generate motors of different form and function. So let's just spin this around so you can see that. Okay. Okay, so briefly, one of the ways we study helicases is not just by lighting up the molecules so we can see them in a fancy camera. One of the ways we study those kinds of motors or motors that exert force is to actually put them in what we call a laser tweezer. And that's when we attach um, DNA or RNA that the helicase is going to work on to a bead on one end and also on the other end. And then we hold the beads a constant distance within a microscope. In this case, in this drawing, one of the beads is held by suction on the end of a pipette, so it's just being held there by force. The other bead is being held in place by a laser beam. And we can hold them at a perfectly constant force and then watch as the helicase unravels the DNA. And in this particular case, if this helicase were to pull this strand of DNA apart, it would get longer, and we could watch the beads get farther and farther apart with time. And in that way, we could watch one molecule of a helicase at a time. Another thing I should mention is that some machines are also studied in a similar way, but they are turned, and they're attached to a bead that's magnetic. And then you take a magnet, and you spin it, and then you can watch a rotary motor deal with the force of the spinning magnet. Now I'm going to show you an experiment. This is actually a really simple experiment. All this is is a laser tweezer that we built in the physics department uh, together with some students um, in my department and some students in physics. And what you see here are two beads, and between them is a piece of DNA. And we're building this machine so we can watch a helicase that we've been working on in the lab. And just this week, we finally got our laser tweezer apparatus to work. And what I'm going to show you is how we can now see the laser tweezer pull the beads apart and move them around. And this took about two years of work to get this thing to work. So this is what it looks like. Okay, so Margaret Trias, who was doing this, first started pulling on this bead. And you can see its distance changing. This one's getting slightly perturbed and pulled, in, pulled along a little less. But now this one is coming back. She's letting it relax. She's going to pull on it really hard this time, really yank on that guy. You can see its distance change. And now she's really pretty sure she's captured the bead, so she's yanking on it back and forth. And it's moving up and down like a yo-yo. Okay, so. In the next set of experiments, which we haven't done yet, so I can't show them to you, we'll put our nanomachine on there and do the same experiment and see how the helicase changes all of these things that we just observed. But I thought you might like this because this is data that's only about three days old. And it's always fun to see what scientists are actually doing right now. So that's what we have on that. OK, so today we've watched three kinds of nature's nanomachines, molecular motors, in action. We watched a walking cargo motor that carries all kinds of things on a highway made of tubulin, and its name is kinesin. We watched an energy producing motor that spins around. So we looked and we even watched ourselves a molecule of F1 ATPase. And we looked at a tracking motor that unzips DNA, and it's called a helicase. So we've seen three different examples of things in nature that are basically nanomachines. All of them burn ATP, and most of them are actually made out of the same sort of Lego pieces, but they just have different shapes and functions. And I want to close by thanking all the people who made this possible. Um, my talk today benefited from the help of a bunch of my colleagues, Kevin Keating, who's a grad student in computational biology, Sean Taylor, who's a graduate student 
in molecular biophysics, Margaret Trias and Andrew Mack, who are grad students in physics. And we have very nice friends who do a lot of this kind of work at University of Illinois, Dr. T.J. Ha and Dr. Jan Chemla, who gave us great ideas for movies and who also sent us some data. But especially today, we want to thank the Howard Hughes Medical Institute because it is doing a wonderful job bringing science to the public through animations and other resources. And this is their website, if you can manage to copy any of that down. And, um, and please make use of all the things that HHMI is doing. So anyway, thanks for your attention and to our organizers also. <laughs>